Hello, everybody, and welcome to the aristocracy. Okay, Destiny's actually here, so I'm gonna drag him in, and we're gonna start. Okay, I'm gonna move Destiny in. You guys have to defend me in DGG chat, okay? Don't let them be mean. Hey. Horace is he? Hey. I think you mean to say hello. Oh, I'm sorry. Hello, dear Destiny. Thank you so much for coming to my stream. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. But yeah, Desi, feel free to introduce yourself since obviously no one knows who you are. Yeah, I'm Destiny. I stream uh, RuneScape old school. RuneScape full time now. And I uh, sometimes I talk about politics and philosophy on my stream when I get really desperate for viewership. That's what I do. Wait, hello? Oh, sorry. I had a, I realized that I accidentally, I had a, a boomer moment. I accidentally muted my stream. That's all right. Oh, nice I'm, a, I'm a super pro streamer. Okay. Um, well. Oh, and that was back when people did. Um, I don't know. Do you remember when people used to do response videos because it would show response videos in the, I think in, in like right underneath the main video. So the the meta was to like make a video responding to another video and shit. Oh yeah, that that's exactly how it was. Why did YouTube ever get rid of that? Do you know? I think it was a horrible fucking feature and idea, and it just led to a lot of dumb fucking people getting like the reply girls and stuff. Like, yeah, I don't know. That was a stupid idea. <laughs> it was funny, what? but. Yeah, now there were a lot of crazy things with YouTube back in the day. Um, mm -hmm. So, what were. What got you? Can you tell us like the story of how you got into streaming? Um, I think it's just literally a long, long time ago. Um, I had a friend, I think, that brought the fact that streaming was even a thing to my attention. And then he told me that, uh, or, and then I kind of just decided to try it because it seemed like, yeah, why not? Um, I kind of was known for being kind of funny. I'm um, at school and I play video games and I'm funny while I play games. So it seemed like a natural fit. It's like, okay, sure. So I downloaded all the stuff, configured all the software, and then, yeah, started streaming. Well, what, what were the extra challenges about streaming at that time, like compared to now? Um, the technology was very primitive, so... Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, you would need, like, five programs running in order to make your stream work. Um, back then, I think we used... There was a program called Flash Media Live Encoder, and then you would have to download an actual encoder for the program to use. Um, and then you had to get... Uh, I think we used Camtasia Studio, I think, for the screen capture. And then you used virtual audio cables to route all of the audio correctly. Um, yeah. So and you had to have all these programs running, and there were no, there was no like help or troubleshooting because nobody, um, like nobody knew what the fuck you were doing, so nobody could help you or or give you any guidance. So if something fucked up, you had to troubleshoot and figure it all out on your own. And so, um, yeah, yeah, so you basically, you probably also needed like tons of screens because there was just so much to control at once. Um, at least two monitors, yeah, but yeah. Well, I guess most people still have two monitors, at least. Yeah. Um, well, for, I don't think that's true, but yeah. Oh. Well, when I guess uh, most people I know that I, that stream usually have like two or three. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like gamers and those types of people have two monitors. Yeah. I don't know if two yeah. monitors has made it into like the normal person having it yet, but yeah. You'd be surprised how many people still use like 1080p screens, for instance. It's pretty crazy. I just downsized from three monitors to two because um, oh, I'm well, trying to be a fun. real grown up. Yeah. You know? Um, so, how has like, how has the streaming world changed socially, like besides the technology? Mm. from like the beginning yeah. days to what's going on yeah now. that's a really broad question i mean everything has changed like literally every single aspect um i think the top like the everything has been toned down a lot in terms of language and everything to, to be more kind of like um i guess advertiser palatable um and then more consumable for mainstream people um i would say that the people that exist today um because back then it there weren't very many people back then if you wanted to be like if you wanted to make a living doing game stuff you were either like a professional gamer or there were very 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 few people like me that could that just were full-time streamers that didn't make um money from tournaments and stuff so there weren't very many people that were like dedicated obsessive clout chasers like people weren't trying to be friends or network or do that much stuff as much there was a lot of networking that went on but it was more like the old school gaming communities mm -hmm. um it wasn't like random people popping up and just trying to be friends with somebody to make a streaming career off of them. So there's like that dynamic that kind of works in the background now. Um, Is that frustrating for you? Um, no, I don't care because I don't do it. So and then I'll I burn bridges really quickly. So I don't care if someone's doing dumb shit. I just tell them I don't have to deal with that. Uh, which in some ways is good, in some ways is bad. So. Yeah. Well, it's funny. Like 
a, a lot of girls just in general have problems where uh, they feel like someone's just talking to them in order to get sex. Um, so mm-hmm. I just wonder if that dynamic exists for you that you feel like people are just talking to you in order to get something out of it for streaming. Um, not too often. It, I don't think it's as often as it could be. I think um, I'm pretty not well connected because I get into fights with so many people that if you're trying to like build a ton of clout, I'm probably not the best ladder to climb because I'm like the last rung on it basically. Is that why you've created the enemies? So you can use them as a shield against the cloud chasers? Sure, yeah, let's go with that one. Yeah. I wish I had fangirls that were trying to fuck me for cloud, but nope. This is the this is the final stop. <laughs> it doesn't get any farther than this. Because I'm not I am not connected at all, so um so like is there a part of you that misses how it used to be, like in the streaming world? Um, yeah, I mean of course. There's always like nostalgia for things that were um, the internet used to be a way, way, way crazier, way more raw, way more unfiltered place. Um, and if you could handle it, that was good. But I mean, I would say that in general today, everything is way more inclusive. So you've got like more audiences today than you wouldn't have had otherwise. Mm-hmm. Um, there are more types of people that are involved in streaming everything today as a result of like the buckling down on like hate speech and stuff, which is good. So I, I mean, there's like there's pros and cons. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, how has it been for you personally? Like, I know you had to leave music um, I think you were in school for music, right? And then you dropped out to do this. Um, mm-hmm. Do you, has it had, like, I guess, um, do you feel like regret at all about like making that sacrifice? Or do you think it was a good decision considering how successful you are now? Um, well, I mean, I regret it back then, of course, because I, I mean, yeah, I, went to, I wanted to go to school for music because I felt really strongly yeah. about it. But um, I was, I had to work at the same time. So, I, I mean, I had to pick one or the other and I, couldn't just not work <laughs> but i'm gonna be like homeless like yeah so i mean i made the decision i had to make so it wasn't really it wasn't really a choice you know in a, in a capitalist society or whatever socialists would say true yeah true um what were some of the toughest moments that you had to deal with like when you got into streaming like in like the um, early days gee, oh wait real quick just i don't know if you're for timelines i didn't drop out of school to do streaming right oh okay Sorry. <laughs> no, that probably would have been no, because I wouldn't. I don't think I would have quit music to do streaming. I dropped out because I was doing other work. I didn't get into oh, streaming because of other work. Think, yeah, yeah, until a few years after I um, quit school. Yeah. Um. Okay. Well, uh, oh, difficult moments in streaming. Yeah, there. I mean, there've been ton. Um, I guess what. Yeah, because you have to tell me some because I like I've kind of learned about you recently. So, um, mm-hmm. I tried to you know I I, ju- I told you the other day that I was going into your lore. And there was just so much that I actually could only touch well, on like 0.2%. Yeah, I've been here a long time, okay? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> man, where to start? So in the very, very, in the back, in the, in the beginning, okay? Um, when Tiger smoked, okay? Long, 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 long time ago. Okay, when the wee hours of the internet. Um, I was, um, back then, so it was called Justin TV, right? Um, Justin TV was the precursor to Twitch, right? Yeah. You following me? Yeah. Okay. So way back then, um, the the Justin TV didn't really have that much, um, didn't really have like that many users. Like people didn't go to Justin TV to look for streams. Mm-hmm. Rather, they usually came from uh, non endemic or external sources. So back in those days, in order to get viewers, what you really wanted to be was listed in the featured section of a website called Team Liquid. So wow, I've never even heard of that. This, this yeah, is exciting. Well, way, my, my viewers way, love a history lesson. You know, so. History lesson way back in the day. Yeah. Um, so I I've always been um, I've always been a very, very independent person um, for whatever reason, through my upbringing or whatever. I've always been an incredibly independent person. And I've always kind of stood on this idea that, you know, I you know, everything should be merit based. And if I do my job well enough, then it shouldn't matter if I have connections or not. Like people will find me and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, um, which is ironic because I got fired from my casino for having similarly stupid thoughts but i guess i didn't learn that lesson so um okay i actually i have to hear that story the casino one um okay well if you depending on how far back you want to go just stop me when it gets boring okay yeah no i'm not sorry so um i think when i was like so i worked i did something called work study in high school so that's where you would do like janitorial work after class every day so that you could pay for your high school education and then I think when I was 18, because that money could only go towards my, um, the cost Wait, of my tuition. Wait, you had to pay for your high school education? Yeah, so my parents wanted me to go to a private high school, but okay. weird stuff happened when I turned like 14 and they basically, we'll just say they ran out of money. <laughs> um, yeah. And then in order to maintain that school, in order to keep going, I had to do work study to pay for the education. So, so interesting um, program. 
Yeah. So when I was, um, I think when I was like 18, I started working at McDonald's because working at, in high school, the money was just going to my tuition. So I needed to start making money so I could like live somewhere. Um, so I started working at McDonald's when I was 18. And then I had a very negative cu customer interaction at McDonald's when I was 18. However, uh, I'm pretty good at dealing with shitty people because I just, I don't give a fuck. It's whatever. And the next person in line past that shitty customer was somebody that worked at a casino, um, Joanne. She was one of the supervisors at the casino. She's like, oh, well, son, you handle that interaction very well. I'm impressed. Do you want to come work at the casino? I'll put in a good word for you. He's like, okay, sure. And I applied to, uh, it was called the Horseshoe Casino at the time at Council Bluffs. I was like, okay, cool. So I applied to the casino and then I had a job at a casino for, um, I think it's like either like two or three years. Um, at the at the casino, I would say that I was like an exemplary worker. Um, because I, I think I did every job in that casino very well. I knew stuff out on the floor um, with like their, they had like a little system for managing comps and stuff. I knew a lot about that. Um, I could do all the prep work. I could do all, I could be, I was competitive for cooking. Any other line cook there, I'd be just as fast as. Um, mm -hmm. I could do everything in front of house as well. Um, I got promoted to shift lead at a very, very, very young age. I think I was the only black badge shift lead in that whole casino. So um, black badge meant that I wasn't technically allowed to walk onto the floor on my own because I was under, 21 i think for the because you had to be 21 i think because it was gambling or it might have been under 18 i don't remember it was one of those was, two I don't was that honest, worth but. it for you to be doing that level of work in order to stay in like a private high school uh well no this was afterwards when i could start doing um college okay. but i would say it was worth it yeah because i started getting paid 15 an hour okay that was a lot of money back then yeah no that is a lot of money like, 535 sure. an hour and i was working a ton of overtime so the overtime was like 22 50 an hour so i was getting a ton, i was making bank and these guys gave you fucking vacation hours like, holy shit. Yeah, and at that so, age, that's huge. Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, so I was working that job. I figured that I was, like, untouchable because um, be because I was such a good worker. Like, everybody like, you know, would have said I was a good worker. I knew, like, so many of the regular customers that would ask for me. I knew so many people in other sections. I was running, like, I had an entire, I had, like, a milkshake mafia, okay? So a lot of the times, these girls would come, um, cocktail server girls would come, and they'd place orders for customers on the floor, right? And usually what they would do is when they put the order in, um, you know, it would go in with the with the normal flow of orders and blah, blah, blah. Well, some of the girls had customers that were like very impatient. A lot of them were poker players who, who are all assholes at casinos. And um, so what would happen is, is if I was on shift that night, what they could do is they could come to me and they could put the order in directly with me. And I would just go back into the kitchen and cook it and be done in, in five or 10 minutes, depending on what it is. And in exchange for that, there was a secret. There was one machine. Not everybody knew about this machine. It was in the diamond lounge, okay? There was one chocolate milkshake machine that existed. So I would get these server girls that would bring me chocolate milkshakes throughout the night so that I, if I were to go back and like specially prepare a meal for their customers, or whatever. So I listen, I loved okay, the casino shit. Okay, I had that shit on lock. But the problem was that there were so many issues there. Like if I I, I can't do my stream notes, I can't like do anything half ass. If we're gonna play a game, I'm gonna sit there and we're gonna fucking grind it nonstop. I can't just play like one or two games of like league or whatever, like every day or week. Like we're gonna we're gonna do ten hours a day. Okay. That's just how I yeah. approach most things. For whatever reason, it's hard for me to like half care about something. Yeah, so you for have my to just go hundred percent. Uh, yeah, one hundred percent. Exactly. Um, so for the casino job, there were a lot of like small dumb things that were pissing me off that like wouldn't get changed. Um, so for instance, uh, one of the things that, oh God, there were so many things. I, there's just so many random stupid things. Anybody that's worked in any quasi corporate environment, um, they're, they're like, I, oh, so here's, so here's one thing. Um, at the end of the day, as a, as a, when you were a supervisor, at the end of the day, you had to put in the variances on the cash registers. So everybody that would turn in their money, you would have to account for what, what did auditing send back to you? How much did they turn in? How much were the total receipts? And you'd have yeah. to keep track of that, right? So every single shift, a supervisor would spend about 30 minutes to 60 minutes doing this work where they would manually input all the data. And I think I spent like one night back there. Um, and in like two hours, I'd basically come up with like a, an Excel spreadsheet because Excel is a very, very powerful technology. It's not just for data entry. OK, you can do a lot of shit on Excel. And what I noticed is that when auditing sends us their numbers, it's always in the same format. And they even if like an employee leaves or enters, it's like there's an they keep an empty space. So I was like, oh, well, you can just make a spreadsheet and copy paste these every night. And I remember I worked on this and I was so proud because I would have saved like fucking 30 to 60 minutes every single shift, every single day. And when I showed it to my uh, manager, I got in huge trouble. And she was like, whoa, 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 we don't do this type of automated stuff. Like it causes so many more errors and it's not good. And I was like, okay, whatever. And we got into a lot of little fights like that before, um, where I remember that like, you have to add up all your receipts at the end of the night and write it down on some piece of paper. And this wastes so much time, okay? And when I'm a supervisor, okay, I'm getting, you know, people are like, okay, well, what are you doing with your hours for your employees and shit? It's like, okay, I've only got so many hours that I can schedule people. Like, and you're making me waste like an hour of their fucking time 
in the back doing math on their dumbass fucking sheet. Auditing checks this stuff anyway, regardless of what they enter. It's a really Why old system. Yeah, it was just stupid as fuck. And I remember like I got written up one time um, because I didn't fill out my, they, something about doing the addition on my paperwork properly because like, I don't have time to waste on this shit. You're paying me like, I'm already staying overtime. I'm working 60 hours a week. So you're going to pay me $22.50 to sit here and do math on, on a piece of paper. This is so stupid. And um, I remember that they told me because I shortcut some of it. They were like, the next time you do this, you need to do this in, in longhand. You, you can't shortcut any of this. And I was like, okay. So the next time I sent out the auditing report, I wrote out every single number. So like 2047 became T-W-O-T-H-O-U-S-A-N-D. Like the stuff, it was really obnoxious, I guess, or whatever. Um, but when I, uh, yeah, so I started to do more and more stuff like that. And then I started to get written up a couple of times, but I, I didn't even think about it. Cause like, there's no way I can get fired from this job because I'm, I'm such a good worker. It's not possible. And then there came, um, there came an issue among other things. Uh, there came an issue with an employee who she was on the, um, she was basically like a newer employee and she was trying to call out because she like hurt her leg or something. And she didn't qualify for FMLA, family medical leave of absence or whatever. She didn't qualify for anything like that. And when she called me, she was like, Hey, like I need to call out. Am I going to be fired if I miss the shift? And she was at nine points. And I, I was like, I mean, you'll be at 10 points. I think you will be. So I called Pam, the manager lady. And I was, t and I was asking, her, I was like, Hey, like, um, Jackie's trying to call in sick. Um, I'm pretty sure she's going to be fired. Like, what, what do I tell her? And, um, Pam hated this girl. Oh my God. She fucking hated you so much. And I remember when I told her, she was like, yes. And I was like, um, yeah. Okay. Well, what do I do? And she's like, you do not have the authority to fire anybody. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. So what do I tell her? And she's like, just tell her she's going to call out. And it's like, okay, well, she's going to be at 10 points. She's like, you can't tell anybody they're going to be fired. It's like, okay, whatever. Um, so I think that there was like, I think she sent, I'm trying to remember the one that got me fired. She sent me some text message. I, I responded back with something along the lines of like, hey, just so you know, like if you, she asked me like, can I call out to a qualified anyone? It's like, no, if you call out, you're fucked. And Jackie eventually went to management with my text message. And then Pam fired me because she said it was an inappropriate um, way to communicate with a subordinate because I said, fuck um oh, and no. i and then she fired me for that yeah the thing that sucked the most is that after that i had already quit music school because i was working so many hours at the casino because i was i was doing like a minimum it was like a minimum of 60 hours a week and so i was made working all overnight. these sacrifices already yeah and i was working overnights too so it was just really 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 hard on top of a uh, music schedule too because all the classes in music school take so many hours it's so stupid um, but eventually i ended up quitting school so i could focus on the casino and then i got fired from the casino so my life kind of like yeah it was, it was bullshit it's amazing that because that was a long time ago and you can just like recall it exactly like the way it happened like the way you told us the story um yeah i mean i might get some details right now but i also talked to my stream a lot we've gone through some of these before so um yep well okay so would you say that what was what was one one of like the first i guess biggest challenges that you had when you started streaming like i guess the um, first big dramas you got involved in or anything like that was probably making connections at Team Liquid. It was so hard to get feature there, but I was like I'm trying to think if I was the, the biggest streamer at that point when I was still trying to get featured and they wouldn't feature me yet, or if I still needed to, or if I wasn't yet. I don't know. If, fuck, I don't remember. But I was, um, it was just really, really, really hard to get featured on Team Liquid because I wasn't part of that in crowd, but I was getting mm -hmm. a lot of viewers. I was easily the most popular viewer in the non featured section. And so like there were a lot of people complaining on on my end they were like oh why isn't destiny featured this is bullshit and then there were problems on their end where it's like well destiny you know he's not friends with anyone at team liquid he's a total outsider like fuck this guy and um yeah that was probably like the first kind of drama i guess it all seems so insignificant now compared to the stuff that happens today but yeah that was like the first big um like roadblock or hurdle i guess in my life yeah do you feel like those moments because i meant i've heard that you've mentioned that you're like a very you consider yourself a very emotionally strong person I don't know if that's the terminology you'd use. Um, I would say emotionally here. disconnected is probably okay. a little bit more accurate, but yeah. Emotionally disconnected. Yeah, I guess it depends on what you, your politics with that kind of stuff. Um, mm. But so would you say that, I don't know, being a public figure contributed to that or have you just always been that way? No, I think I've always been that way. So like you, you just remember ever since you were growing up that you were just I've like always very just been distant. very, 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 um, yeah, very independent, very disconnected. Yeah. Well, did that end up helping your career? Yeah, I think so. Probably one of the only, if not the only, streamer at my size that hasn't had to take breaks because of like big emotional breakdowns or like lots of turmoil with other communities or stuff like that. And I think I probably deal with a disproportionate amount of hate and vitriol. Yeah, yeah, for for sure. as well. So, yeah, I think it's helped me quite a bit. Yeah, I think it's been a huge asset. 
I, yeah, I mean, you've never made a video saying like, here's my truth or something like that. Um, <laughs> but... Yeah, nah. If I, generally what happens is if I see like a situation is fucked and there's just no, everything is just whatever, I usually, we just go full into the memes. Um, so yeah, it just depends on what's going on. Um, yeah, I remember with the, with the animator arc, there was a time when I got into a fight with a bunch of animators and it, and I saw that it was coming down into that. And basically when, um, when shit is fucked, it's just time to start memeing on everybody and moonwalk into the, into the next, uh, into the next arc, I guess. So I don't give a fuck. But I'm guessing distant doesn't mean that you don't like have any feelings, right? Like there was probably like a moment or something that did kind of bother you when, cause I mean, you've gotten shit from the right wing, right wing people and left wing people and all around. Um, so there must've been something that someone said or did something that just kind of particularly grinded your gears, I guess. Um, I mean, there's stuff that makes me upset for sure. Um, but it doesn't like I, I'm, No, I have no respect for 99% of the people in this industry. There's, I don't, I can't think of, there's a few people I think that could hurt me, I guess. Like I've got a few long-term friends, like if Mr. Mooten or Dan would have like fucking hate me or something, I'd probably like, oh shit, well that sucks. But like m for most of the people in here, they're just trash human beings. I don't give a fuck what most of these people think. So you have to value someone in order to care about them. That makes sense. It's probably mm -hmm. a good attitude for a lot of people to, to take. Mm -hmm. I think that for most people, I think that the, the stock, the default opinion is I think you usually dramatically overvalue what other people think and that causes other people's words and actions to be way more hurtful. Yeah, no, uh, I have that problem 100%. Mm -hmm. I think it's really, really common. I don't think that's uncommon at all. Yeah. So what would you recommend for people who have that issue? Like, um, um, oh, about what people yeah, think? Yeah, if you would have watched me like six or seven years ago, I had so much advice relating to that. Um, I think these days I'm a little bit more intelligent. I don't know if you can just advise away somebody's like default, like human characteristic. Mm -hmm. um, I think that this is probably something that formed with me over years and years and years. No, I'm sorry, over decades. Like my, like the formative years of my life is probably where this came from. Um, so the idea that somebody could give you a piece of advice to just have people stop caring, um, I, I don't know if that's realistic. I don't know if that's like a reasonable thing to expect a, a human to do, right? Yeah. Well. So, but there have been some dramas or conflicts that have happened that directly impacted um, or were impacting your personal life, right? Like, um, mm -hmm. uh, there was that, um, what's her, what was her name? I think Anna Frills, like whole saga <laughs> that I've been yeah. researching, right? Um, and I, I think like one of the big criticisms was that was feeling like that there have been people who have potentially tried to like destroy your relationship online um mm -hmm. with uh your fiance and stuff like that probably also does that not hurt like i don't know no i don't give a fuck if i if i feel like that stuff is a legitimate threat i just start like cutting connections um i yeah uh, i think me and melina are pretty okay but like if i feel like some friend is being turned against me or some weird shit i usually just stop talking because i don't i just don't have time to like play those games in the background of like running around and trying to convince people that i was right on something or whatever so i don't care fuck it yeah i just i just cut them off that shit is starting to happen yeah i wonder if that's also like the kind of attitude that's attracted people to you particularly right because it's unique and probably there's something really freeing about feeling that way and not being like caged in by yeah, I mean if you can do it but there's like but there's pros and cons to everything though that's so like I used mm -hmm. to present all of this as like a massive pro but I think that I probably have an atypical amount of disconnection for most people and I miss out a lot on, on what are otherwise probably normal human experiences as, as a result of that too so I mean like there's there's like there's like pros and cons to like everything um I wouldn't say that like I have like the like the superior shonen trope fucking personality or whatever because there's like there's there's just there's pros and cons to everything I think it's really important to keep that in mind yeah, well, what, what are the, some of the cons, do you think? Like, what are those moments that you think you've missed out on? Um, I, just, I think I'm a really emotionally disconnected person. So I think that, like, relationship-wise, um, dealing with people can be very hard. Um, like, I'm, um, I'm a very... I'm trying to find any word to use besides, like, logical. But, like, if things don't make sense to me in terms of, like, why would somebody be upset about something, it's very hard for me to empathize. I have to take... I ha it's... It, for me to empathize with other people is like a massive like intellectual exercise. I have to spend a lot of time on it. And if I'm irritated or annoyed or doing something else, it's very easy for me to totally just write off or discount somebody's feelings, which is which is really bad and really unhealthy, really stupid. Um, so there's just like a lot of like that type of processing that goes on um, to, to maintain any type of healthy relationship. 
you know, like therapists will always say things like, you know, that person's emotions, they might not be rational, but they're valid. And, Mm -hmm. um, and I've always understood that that's, it's really important to respect that, but it's also like Mm -hmm. a really challenging thing to understand what that means by validity. Cause validity usually means like at least somewhat connected to truth Mm -hmm. or rational, right? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. I think valid. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think I understand these a lot better now, especially in my thirties. I've gotten a lot better at doing this than, especially than I was in my early twenties, but, um, Yeah. Has that helped you like get I and feel free if you if I'm getting like too personal, right? Feel free to just say you're not comfortable. But mm-hmm. um has that helped you like with getting into the relationship with Melina, right? Cuz from my understanding it's more of a, a recent thing, right? Like in the last few years. Um in terms of like being more understanding of other people's feelings. Yeah, I think it's helped me a great deal in yeah, terms like of getting engaged Melina and, and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. So, um do you find it easier to meet people online mm. like than in real life? Because I heard you said that you really value in real life interactions much more. Yeah, I mean, like it's easier to meet people online because of the, the um, number of people you can meet online for sure. Yeah. But um, I, I online interactions are nothing like real life interactions. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I very much value any type of real life interaction with someone and even meeting somebody online. Um, it's so much different in person. Holy shit. There are people that I've met online that I thought were like pretty cool and then I meet them in real life and it's like, ugh. And then there are yeah, people that I meet online um, when I meet them in real life. It's like, oh my God, like I click. Um, there's like, I hate to use this word because it's so mysterious, but like I definitely believe in the concept of chemistry and there are just some people where when you meet them in real life, you click with them hardcore and I don't think that can be established online or maybe you can get hints of it, but um, yeah. So sometimes really you hard. connect with someone online or you have that chemistry and it just does not translate to real life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like there are some people in my life that I definitely feel I could only interact with online, mm-hmm. but yeah. Um, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Um, what do you mean but, you don't know? It's right in front of you. Well, uh, how would you describe? Okay. When you meet someone in person, <laughs> okay. Um, when you meet someone in person, um, in real life, like, how do you say, how do you explain what you do? I when they're, don't. When, I- you, you I think don't? at this point, I typically meet people that are like in industry or like tangential to it. So they already kind of know. Um, I would meet people before, but it, it, I, fuck, I haven't met any out of industry people in a while, actually. But um, I think before it would just depend. It would be varying levels of what I would explain, depending on how familiar they were with the technology and everything. Because like everything that I do and everything I'm involved in is really fucking weird. Um, if yeah, you're, it's like, just a total hard outfitter. to describe to normies, right? Yeah. I remember there was a girl that I met down here because when I, when I moved to Glendale initially, um, I was on Tinder a lot because I very much valued meeting people off like the streaming platforms because it was fun seeing like real normal human beings again. And uh, I remember one girl, we went to um, uh, BJ Steakhouse or whatever. And when we were eating, I remember that she, because I she started to ask me more about what I did or whatever. She's like, oh, like when you blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, you know, I'm kind of, I kind of do YouTube. It's kind of, it's a thing online. It's hard to explain. And she's like, oh shit. Like, um, like, are you kind of like popular? Do you know a lot of people? And I was like, yeah. And she's like, oh my God, I used to watch this guy um, who uploaded videos all, all the time and he stopped, um, John Tron. I don't know if you've heard of him before. And I was like, oh yeah, uh, I know that yeah, guy. Yeah, you've uh, talked but- to him before, right? Yeah, well, yeah, um, to put it lightly, yeah. So, yeah, there have been, like, a lot of, um, yeah, it's hard to explain what I do to, to normal people online, yeah. Are those moments still cool, even though it's, you've been doing this for so long? It's, like, 10 years or something, right? Um, Yeah, or 11 or 12 years. Yeah, so, like, are those moments still cool where you get to meet someone in person, even if it's rare, and, um, you know, and, like, they're talking, and it's just totally disconnected, and you get to be like, oh, I actually interacted with this person, like, I talk to them, you know, or they hate me or they love me. Like you're part oh, of like meeting like celebs and stuff in real yeah. life. Oh, no, I just don't like most people. I don't care about most of them. I really don't. There's very, very few people. There's one guy that I've gotten to talk to that I was super excited. I got to talk to and it was Who? Who was it? Sean Carroll. I love that guy. Um, but other than that, I don't know. Fuck them all. My chat's telling me that you canceled John Tron. Um, so. Yeah, it was probably one of my most popular talks, I think. Yeah. What, what happened there? Um, I listened to, do you know, like, summary. do you know who Sargon of Akkad is? Yeah. yeah. I listened to Sargon of Akkad and John Tron and there was some third guy and they were talking someday and, um, they, it was just so weird because I heard John Tron just repeating like so many, like 4chan talking points, like right out of the politics boards. And I was like, what the fuck is happening? So 
I saw John Tron retweet or tweet something about like Japanese people are allowed to keep only Japanese people. Why can't we do the same in, in America? And I, um, I think I tweeted, I was like, yo, we should chat about this. I'm just curious. And he's like, okay. And then he hopped on to talk and I thought it was just going to be like, um, I, I, I thought that the conversation was going to be like, he was going to say like, oh, you know, well, I've heard this meme. And I was like, oh, well, that meme is like kind of racist. Don't you think? And he's like, oh, I didn't really know that that's what that meant. And I was like, yeah, sure. That's kind of how I expected the conversation to go. Mm -hmm. But um, he just went fucking headstrong right into the craziest shit. And I just was not ready. He like he was like saying that like, well, how do you explain? Oh, God, I don't want to miss this. But didn't he say like, like black people in Africa commit crime and black people in the US commit crime and wealthy black people in America commit more crime than the poorest white people in America. And, you know, if Mexicans will come to the United States, they need to assimilate into the gene pool. And I was like, holy shit, John, what the fuck? And this guy was like, a, he was just like a, I wouldn't say family friendly, but this guy was like known as like a more PC, like friendly kind of like YouTuber game grumps or whatever the fuck, like yeah. all this shit. I was like, oh my God, I, did, I was not ready for that conversation. I was like, oh my God. But, well, yeah, I think at that time, shit. a lot of people had like secret, I, I don't always say secret views, but just they wouldn't talk about politics in public. And it was a very common sentiment that, oh, it's not politically correct. So just not going to mention it. Mm -hmm. That's crazy, though, that um, that he said all that stuff to you. Yeah, it was pretty. Uh, it was it's, uh, what's it was insane to me is how different the Internet, especially like the YouTube world, has changed. Mm -hmm. Um it used to it feels like there used to be very few leftists on youtube or i guess liberals or whatever you want to call it um mm -hmm. and it was mostly just like anti-sjw kind of content mm -hmm. um why oh, do you think be that before that i don't know if you yeah. i don't know how long you've been on youtube it was the age of the atheist too that was like oh I think yeah the, yeah yeah <laughs> sure. i think the first big like social if i can remember the first big like social kind of internet movement i want to say was the were the the atheists four horsemen or whatever um because i think that's how thunderfoot started out i think i remember yeah, there used to be a lot of like hitchens and dawkins videos i think would get posts like poning uh christians and shit and dumb stuff like that uh, but then yeah then i think from that they got bored because religion was shit um, and they and it, they mostly moved into anti-sjw stuff yeah a lot of them became kind of anti-sjws yeah basically yeah how um, what were your political views back then were you also kind of a part of that crowd yeah i was definitely like a gamer bro um I think um, I did. Uh, would I have been? I think I would have largely characterized my views back then as probably anti SJW. I don't think I was quite in the Gamergate movement because I think I'd moved on before that movement took form. Mm -hmm. but like in the early um, 2010s, I'm pretty sure I was like a, basically like an anti SJW gamer where most of my opinions would have been that, you know? Has it been hard for you that like so many of your old opinions, because the internet's forever and you work on the internet? So, mm -hmm. so many of your old opinions are just online and they're just there forever. Like uh, I personally, I think it's awesome. I, I like that I can see a lot of growth. Um, my, my Probably my biggest fear in life, the thing that I worry about the most, especially because I have a public platform and especially because I can be like very, um, we'll say confident in my opinions. Mm -hmm. So I always worry that I'm going to look back in 10 years and realize, oh my God, like I've been totally wrong about something for so fucking long. And I was just, my head was so far up my ass. I just didn't see it. So when I can like look back like every few years and see how my opinions have like evolved and changed on things, like I consider that to be a mark of progress. Um, there's a lot of people that will try to cancel me over like crazy shit. Um, if you dig far back enough in my Reddit history, you can find like N words and stuff, I'm sure. Um, or like for YouTube videos floating around online, like I don't care. I, I think I like to see the fact that I've grown and changed. I think that's really important to me. And I think that if I can grow and change from something, I think that theoretically any person can grow and change from something. So yeah, I don't, I don't like delete old shit of mine or, or stuff like that. I don't want to like cover anything up or hide it. I think it's good to show growth. Yeah. Do you, so I'm guessing you have a lot of criticisms for um, how people deal with um problematic like behavior in the past so where do you think what do you think are like some behaviors that it's just like full cancel they can't even if they've shown that they've grown you know uh well so grow. for me personally um i don't think anything like that exists but like i take a view on like for justice for criminal justice for instance it's like i believe in like rehabilitative justice um okay. so like i don't think that anybody is like irredeemable and if they've stopped a certain behavior then i think that's fine if you yeah you know, it's as simple as that the idea of like trying to hold people to account for past behavior if they're not doing it anymore is just really dumb for me. But I, I take that like, um, I don't know if I'd say like autistically far in like every aspect of my life. Um, so like, for instance, like I don't care about like apologies or whatever. Like I, 
make me cringe. Like if somebody does something dumb, I just want to know they're not going to do it again. Um, I think apologies are cringe and I don't like to hear them ever. So, but yeah, basically I just want, as long as people are acting okay, um, I don't, I don't care what, what they did in the past. Fuck it. Okay. But aren't you kind of like devaluing my culture as a Canadian by saying that you don't like apologies? You know, that's where um, I feel very hurt by what you just said. It's kind of hard. So that's like a, that's a kind of like a question of categorization. Um, it's like a deeply philosophical question. Can I devalue <laughs> a Canadian's culture when all of their culture is downstream from American culture and I love American culture? I don't know if that's possible or not. I can be critical of sub aspects of US culture, for instance, Canadian culture, um, without necessarily shitting on it. So no, I don't think that's a bad one. Okay, well, I'll note to self, do not ever apologize to Desney, even when he deserves an apology. Good. Okay. Um, so, um, what have you tried uh, to remedy, I guess, those past remarks, right? Like, have you made, um, have you worked on, I don't know, like, what's an example of something that you've said in, or done in the past? You don't need to say it directly right now, so I, I don't want to get my Twitch canceled. Um, um what's on sure, the, I'll be example? respectful of your platform. I mean, like, you can find, I think in 2011, I think there's a video of me in Creffield, Germany, talking to Richard Lewis, defending white people saying the N-word, how it shouldn't matter, because it's just a word. Um, I mean, you can find like almost any gamer bro opinion <laughs> from like 2010, 2011, 2012. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what do you do to remedy that? Like, I don't have to remedy shit. I've changed, like my views have changed. I've updated my views over time. Like the idea that you need to go on like some apology tour and like, you know, that I need to go find and like shake the hand and kiss the feet of like every black person that I encounter to make up for past. That's a fucking cringe. I don't care about that shit. Um, my views have evolved. Um, I think that it's easy to see that my views have changed over time. Like that's good enough for me. I've totally done the apology tour though. Like, and I know it's cringe, but it almost feels like a requirement in today's because it's, it's so frustrating when people have views about you that are just not true, right? Yeah, but I, but I mean, like to those people, no amount of apology. I'm just not gonna apologize. It's so cringe. Why would I apologize for something I don't believe in anymore? It's a virtue signal, purity test, stupid waste of time. Is there a part of you that's like, it's kind of like your ego? You know, you just feel like you should No, it's it? I don't expect it from other people either. If somebody did some dumb bad shit, and I'm ruthlessly consistent on this too. You can ask anybody, like, yeah. if anybody did some dumb or bad shit, it was like five years ago. Like, I don't care. I, I I just like, what all I care about is like, what do they do now? Like, that's all I care about. That's literally, and that's all anybody should care about. The obsession of like what people did in the past is just cringe. That's super duper cringe. Um, what a... What's one of like those really big views that you've changed? Like what's probably your biggest change? I don't know. Oh, as of 10 years ago. So I think what happened was I think my fundamental views, like the very baseline things that I think I kind of thought through when I was like probably 16, 17, 18, I think most of those have been stable over time. But I think what's moderated the applied position at the very end has just been like life experience. Um, so for instance, um, like very fundamentally, I would say that we probably shouldn't let words bother us like as much as we can. I, I think that we, we're, you give a lot of power to other people. I think that you kind of mess your own mind up when that happens. Um, that's like a thing that I would have said at like 18 and internally, I still feel like that would be like a cool thing to achieve. Um, however, I'm more realistic now in terms of like how people navigate the world, how people are affected by their environments and that like saying that this is something we ought to do is a bit naive and doesn't take into account the lived experience and the general emotional processing of like most people. Mm -hmm. um, so that's like an example of something where it's like my, my fundamental belief is kind of still the same, but like I understand now how it plays out publicly is, is a lot different. You're more than, practical, right? Yeah. Like that's mm -hmm. what I was saying. And yeah. I would have, and back then I, I may, I had a really big problem with, I, um, I do think that the way that I process stuff emotionally is probably a bit different than most people. And I would project that onto everybody um, mm -hmm. without realizing it. It's like, oh, well, you just shouldn't let anything bother you, blah, 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 blah. You know, um, there, there have been a few times in my life where this has come up and I saw a schism in really big ways and it super bothered me. Um, so one example that I give a lot of this is um, I used to say starting probably I think around 2013, um, I was um, or maybe even before then. Um, I would have the gamer gratitude whenever like a black person or minority would ever be like, oh, like we need more representation in video games. Like my response would be like, who the fuck cares if like the people are white or male? Like you can just identify with whoever. Like, is it actually that big of a deal? Does this really yeah, matter Yeah, I used much? to have that view too. Like it was yeah. so common back then. Mm -hmm. But I used to, I legitimately like, for me personally, I legitimately believe that. I don't give a fuck who the characters are. Like I really don't care. And I would project that into everybody. But something that I noticed is, I want to say it was in 2013. A new there was a new FIFA game that came out and I think the main character of the FIFA game was like Hispanic and 
I mean, I don't, first of all, I don't even play FIFA, but even if it was, I wouldn't give a fuck who the care. I don't care if it's Hispanic. But then I started to notice that like all the gamer bro white people were like legitimately enraged. They were like incest. Like, why the fuck is this character Hispanic? Like, how the fuck am I supposed to play this shit? I was like, wait a second. Yeah, they were not consistent thought, at all. <laughs> yeah, wait. Yeah, I thought we didn't care about this shit. Wait, did you guys only not care because it wasn't affecting you? Oh, the main character might've been black, not Hispanic. Yeah, but, but it was like, yeah. So I guess actually it was important. It's just these people were saying it wasn't because it didn't affect them at the time. So yeah, I've noticed a lot of dumb shit like that too. Yeah, so like you ended up moving away, I guess, from that crowd. Was there part of you just didn't want to be like associated with it? But I guess you don't um, really care about that shit. Yeah, I don't care about being associated with it. I just didn't. It just wasn't my beliefs. So. Um. Well, okay. Let's talk about your views, though. Um. So you consider that you consider yourself a liberal, right? Or would you say an omni liberal? I don't know. <laughs> sure. Whatever. You, yeah. Sure. Uh, um, I, yeah, I'm like a sock dumb, I guess. A sock dumb. Okay, so what does that mean? Like, how would you describe that to someone? Um, a social democrat means that I'm avowedly a capitalist, but I um, I think that we need way bigger social safety nets in the United States. And um, yeah, we'll go with that one. Yeah. Well, you get a lot of pushback about believing in capitalism, right? Especially yeah, by a lot of stupid left. financially and economically literate like socialists, but what, what are you going to do? Have you ever heard a good argument? No. Um, Never. You've never had a good argument no, against capitalism. Because there are no, because nobody that identifies as a socialist knows anything about econ or finance. So they, they, they're not even in a position to give good arguments. So. But there are a lot of people who still like capitalism, but they still recognize like a lot of the problems associated with it. They just don't see a better alternative. Sure. I recognize there's a lot of problems too. That's why we do the best we can with like... Um, okay. So yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So you mean like you just don't think there's a, a better option? Uh, there might be. It's possible. Um, it Maybe socialism even is that option, and we make incremental changes to get there, but most people that identify as socialists are just children on the internet just want to be mad at something. Maybe mommy and daddy were too big of a capitalist or something, so this is their way of rebelling. Um, have you read, like, any Marxist literature or anything? Fuck no. I tried to read Capital, and I think I got, like, 50 pages through, so I got enough if to- If that's a hard read. Yeah, yikes. But I know what the LVT is now, <laughs> and I understand- yeah. Um, and I can give like these are criticism marks so we can talk about like the transformation problem and shit like that. Um, so I know enough, I probably honest to God reading 50 pages of capital probably means I've read more marks than 99.99999% of other lefties on the internet. That's true. Um, but yeah, the, the problem is it's just like the problem is it's one of those things like Marxism is on the level of like Holocaust revisionism where like if I really wanted to go super in depth and give a debunk of it, one, the knowledge is incredibly niche. Two, it doesn't apply to anything that's happening today in the world. And like three, like most of the people you're debating don't know that much about anything else anyway. So like, why the fuck would I waste my time? Yeah. But I, I, I mean, like I'll still debate socialism with people they want, but I've like all the arguments that I've gotten from other socialists are just wholly like unconvincing. They're just so horrible. Yeah, I haven't looked too much into the economic theory with Marx. My my big problem with Marx has always been the way he viewed history and the way he justifies communism is often through history. And a lot of people don't talk about that because um, he has like this kind of wig attitude of history that history is all is like this moving thing that's always moving in this upward trajectory as we become more civilized and more civilized. Um, and it's like a very false idea that's just being thrown out by historians. But Marxists well, are all, always on. first of all. Marx was a philosopher, okay? Historians don't get to throw that out because the idea of whether or not we've made progress or not is not in the domain of historians, okay? That is in the domain of philosophers. So the question of moral oh, yeah, progress sorry. or the question of progress towards some end is not a question that any fucking historian should concern themselves with, all right? Number one. Um, yeah, number two, dialect and materialism is kind of cringe, so. But. Um, okay. So what are your opinions that... Uh... Um, before I, I can just tell the historians in chatter are very angry. Um, mm -hmm. what, what are your opinions? What are the opinions that you would say you get like the most pushback on, like the most extreme ones? Um, probably, um, I would say pr um, probably the debate I had last night is a controversial opinion I have. I don't think corporate lobbying is anywhere near like the levels of problems that people think it is. I think the voter participation is our biggest problem. And I think we need to take steps to rectify that before worrying about like corporate lobbying or anything, which I think is kind of irrelevant on the grand scale. That's probably one of my more controversial opinions. Um, I also support the Citizens United decision. Um, that seems controversial, but as soon as I start talking to somebody about it, it becomes very obvious very quickly that they don't know anything about Citizens United. And then they end up agreeing with me kind of hesitantly at the end because they don't know anything about it. So um, yeah, I don't know. What is Cit Citizen United? I'm guessing it's an American thing. Yeah, it was a big Supreme Court decision, basically, that had to do with, like, campaign financing. And a lot of people are mad because it leads to, like, super PACs. But then when you start talking to them about, like, the implications of going the other way, they very quickly realize that things are way more complicated than they thought.
Yeah, that that's, I, I guess, in general, my problem with a lot of American politics and the way Americans, particularly the progressive left, talk about American politics, that mm-hmm. they often just glorify other systems from other countries um, without... I don't know, recognizing the consequences of them. Like uh, one of the most common things I hear is criticizing the two, two party system. I don't know your feelings on that, but um, if you go towards a multi-party system and often leads to, you know, issues with coalitions and people being able to form governments without actually receiving the majority of votes. Um, yeah, I, I talk about this a lot. It's really funny because a lot of Americans will cry and bitch and moan. Like, oh, two parties. Like, I don't like the idea that Joe Manchin fucking he has all the power in the U.S. We only have two parties. It's so bullshit. And it's like, man, dude, you should see coalitions where fucking governments that have like five fucking members in Congress are making all the fucking calls because they formed a coalition government. And now they're mm-hmm. like the most powerful people. Like, yeah, there's there's all sorts of pro- there is no like silver bullet system. Like, I, I'm I'm honest to God, like and maybe I just need to do more reading. on I'm not really sold on the concept of coalition government over like a two party system. It, it seems to me like both of them have their strengths and weaknesses, but like we have like a decent variety of opinion expressed through the primary system in the US. So like picking who's going to be the candidates from the two parties, basically. Um, I, I think that there are some strengths to coalition governments. I think there are some strengths to two party systems, but I, I'm not really su- super convinced that one system over another is massively better. Yeah. And and I've heard a lot of complaints and I've seen like a lot of weird, funny shit in um, some European governments where there is like this, there like there's like a fucking Green Party that has like four members in Congress, but for some reason they're so fucking powerful. And then you find out the reason why is because they formed a coalition with another party that gives them like a majority or something in government. Yeah. And it's like, oh, okay. So yeah, it's a dumb shit like that. Yeah. That's why whenever you're arguing with a lefty, you can just bring up Israel, right? It's such an example. And usually most lefties are very critical of Israel. They just say, Mm -hmm. like, it's one of the biggest causes of keeping someone like Netanyahu in power. He never wins the elections, yet he's always in power because he's the one willing to make coalitions with the extremist parties. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which, you know, force him to do things like build more settlements and stuff. So, Mm -hmm. and I'm sure it's the case in lots of other countries with similar systems. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay. What's a, I don't know. So how do you think that that debate went last night with uh, with Prime Case? Um, I think it was okay. Um, have you have you debated that topic before? Or was that like the first time? Um, I've talked a, a bit of, around it before. It's not it's still not an idea that I'm 100% sold on. I changed I dramatically changed my opinion on this. Um, if you would have caught me five years ago, um, I supported Bernie Sanders because honest to God, my biggest, the most important issue to me was um, getting corporate money out of politics, campaign finance reform and stuff. That was literally my number one issue. It was the yeah, most important. Yeah, that is such a pivot. Like- yeah. Um, somebody challenged me on something. It might have even been a guy called Excuse Me. Somebody challenged me on something. He was like, oh, uh, corporate lobbying isn't even that big of a deal. And it was just something that was so stupid when he said it. I was like, you're so obviously fucking wrong. Um, but anytime somebody challenged me on something, I usually try to be introspective about it. I was like, okay. So I started to try to look for examples. Like, okay, well, I know this guy is wrong. Um, and then when I started to ask myself questions about like corporate finance, I was like, okay, so like, Let's go and find some examples of like, what are some like pieces of legislation that corporations have been super, you know, pushing that like citizens aren't in favor of. And when I started to try to dig into like the kind of the proofs of how fucked up corporate finance was or like corporate lobbying, I couldn't find anything. And I was like, oh my God, I think I'm actually just 100% fucking wrong on this. And you know, like you can find things around the edges or you, or you can find like things in the fringes where it's like, oh, you know, like this corporation like suggested this like line and this blah, blah, blah. And you can find some stuff. It's like, okay, yeah, mm-hmm. that's pretty shitty. But overwhelmingly, like I, I, I the, the, the thing that I keyed in on more was the major failure of politicians wasn't actually failures at all. It was that they were appeasing a voter base that isn't representative of the American population because the voter base is not representative of the American population. Population. That basically, what, what it feels like, what happens is, is only certain sections of the United States like population votes, and those are the sections that are going to be most represented among our politicians. So my my view completely changed that to where now, like the biggest thing I'm in favor of is I think there should be mandatory voting. I think that if mandatory voting happened, I think you would see the biggest shift in legislative priorities in like the history of the United States. We would, like po- politicians would start caring way more about issues affecting middle and lower class Americans if they if everybody was actually compelled to vote. What's the good argument against um, against mandatory voting? Hello. Uh, hello. Oh, I think I froze a bit. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. What's the good? Um, what's the argument? Like a good argument against mandatory voting? I haven't found any. Um, there, there was only. Um... Oh, sorry. You were talking about I didn't hear you. Sorry. Um, the the only thing that I um, 
initially, th there was one thing that kept me against mandatory voting in, in initially. And the argument was, if you don't want to vote, I think you should have just as much a right not to vote as a right to vote. I think that's equally important. And I held on to that argument for a long time because um, that felt really strong to me. And then I, one person in chat, I think randomly typed out like, well, if you wanted to, you could just write in protest vote if you don't want to vote for anybody. And I was like, oh, sure. So now I'm just, yeah, 100% on board with mandatory voting. You, there should be a big fine attached to not voting. Um, but you so, would be yeah. okay with people like Xing out their vote when they went. Yeah, if they wanted to. If you want to write in protest vote or something, sure, you can do that. But yeah, otherwise, yeah, mandatory voting. Oh, that's interesting. I haven't really heard that as like a, a viable mm -hmm. Oh, wait, real quick. Um, I haven't found any. You cannot force the population to vote. Jesus Christ. Venga, 0712. Other countries already do it, you illiterate dipshit inbred fuck. Sorry. Go ahead. Do you ever feel bad when you call someone inbred? You know? Um, no, bread is awesome. Inbred is awesome. But there, bread there are all these problems associated with it, like genetic. They're inbred, and stuff. okay? They're inside bread. They're just wrapped up in a sandwich of stupidity, okay? That's all I'm saying. All right, got me there. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so you were talking earlier about like that moment that you realized that you were wrong. Is that is that a good moment for you, or like how does it feel when you kind of? Because I've been through those, like when you're reading through something and it's just all hitting you about like this way that you viewed a certain issue is just completely bullshit. Um, I mean, I, I just, I want to have like the most correct opinions. Like that's what I'm the most concerned about. I want to make sure that whatever idea that I have is like the most reflective of reality and is the most correct it can be. So if it means that I evolve my, uh, my position on something, that's fine. Like I'm way more concerned with being correct on something than holding on to some ideological purity or consistency or holding on to some idea that I've held on to for a long time. Like those types of things are just wholly unconcerning to me. I don't care about that. Did you ever have this problem that um, when you were engaging in debates with people that like assuming that they were the same way that if they could just be if their mind could just be changed if like if they could just uh, hear the truth right and hear the evidence their mm -hmm. mind would just be changed but obviously most people are not like that right yeah I grew out of that real quick I don't think most people are like that yeah yeah I, I that that was the experience I had when I started debating Holocaust deniers initially mm -hmm. I had like this idea that yeah, they were all just super um, they'd just been sold the wrong idea and they just genuinely believed that those things hadn't happened and mm -hmm. they just needed to be um, taught like how to find the evidence for themselves and how to do all the work that historians have done. Um, mm -hmm. And voila, the problem would be solved. But while that was the case for like a minority, the majority, they, they actually were like full out lying, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had that. I've had that several times pop up. When I first, my first conversation with Nick Fuentes, I thought that like, oh, this guy's like me. He's just all right. But it seems like he's pretty convinced. He's found a lot of information. It's like, okay, cool. Um, in my first conversation, he knew a lot of shit that I didn't. So I had yeah. a lot of research to do. And then uh, after that conversation, I like, I did a fuck ton of research. I put together like some 25 page document of like all the shit I wanted to talk about. I was like, oh, let's have a, let's revisit the conversation. Cause I'm curious, like how a mind like mine will adapt to being shown that they're very wrong. And man, that guy um, is very much dug into what he believes in. It does not give a fuck about anything that comes his worldview so yeah mm -hmm. um so uh i kind of want to move into like more personal stuff with your relationship if you don't mind um okay. i've never had the pleasure of meeting melina but i've heard mm -hmm. about her um and so how, could you tell me like how you guys met initially um, it's kind of a long story. The simple version is basically just she messaged me uh, online. We started chatting and then I had like an opportunity to like take a vacation and I decided to go to the area she was at. Met a couple of friends, met her and yeah. And you guys just boom, chemistry, right? Um, yeah, I think we clicked a lot in real life. Yeah. Um, so like we live in like this world that sees the value in exclusive re romantic relationships, right? Um, uh -huh. and I know that you two are in an open relationship. Um, does like that ever bother you? Or, I mean, you've mentioned that you don't really give a shit what other people think, but has it ever caused any problems like where other people just did not value your connections or what you've built with her because it's open? Um, yeah, I mean, I think other people will judge harshly all the time, but I mean, like, what, I mean, I don't care. <laughs> like, what, right? Well, how would you explain like an open relationship or why it's just as special? Because I'm assuming you think it is, right? Um, compared to like an exclusive one. So when somebody says like just as special, it sounds like they're trying, like I'm never going to try to justify any of my connections to another person. I like, there are so many things. I can't think of almost anything I could give a fuck less about than somebody else's evaluation of how I value something. Um, I mean, I like my relationships are important to me. Um, 
yeah, that's, I don't know. I, I don't even know how I would approach conversations like, oh no, trust me, my relationship is just as real as yours, blah, blah, blah. Like when half of like all marriages end divorce or some shit, like I'm not going to argue with some monogamous loser about fucking, not that you're a loser just because you're monogamous, but some loser that's trying to argue with me about the validity of my relationship. I don't even know if I would take that argument up. Um, what would you say to people when you're giving for advice if, if they're debating whether or not they want to in, be in an open relationship or not? Um, I don't recommend them for 99% of people. I think it's really, really, really hard. Um, for, I, I, I don't know. I, I, for me personally, for whatever reason, I don't, I just don't get jealous. It's just not like a feeling that I really have that much. So I don't really care that much. Um, so then it's like, well, do I want to have sex with one person for the rest of my life? Like, absolutely fucking not. So like an open relationship yeah. is like the only thing that can work for me. But I think for a lot of people, I think that feelings of like jealousy are very easy to creep up. Um, so for instance, even in monogamous relationships where people are very strong, they love each other and blah, blah, blah. And they're like, oh, cool. Like we should try a threesome. Like that one singular thing among two people that are very confident and assured in their love will like destroy the relationship. Like stuff like that yeah. can happen. So yeah, I don't know. I, if you want to try open relationships, I guess you can, but I don't recommend them for everybody. Um, sometimes it feels like there's like some trendy thing um, where people are saying like every like monogamous relationships are lame and everybody should be in open relationships. I don't yeah. think that's true. I, I think that very few people can handle any relationship really, but like especially open relationships. So yeah. Does in general just having to juggle for a lot of people struggle to just maintain one relationship, right? Is there mm -hmm. and but you probably have to maintain like a lot of them and maintain your main one. Is that ever like a challenge? No, I mean I'm like I'm pretty open with like what I'm after and things. Like I don't have like multiple fucking relationships or whatever. I barely have time for one. Like I generally So you're from, exclusive like, like romantically, right? For open sexual? Um I don't know if I'd say that. I guess it depends on how you view it. Like um like if I hook up with somebody, like chances are we're also gonna like watch a movie or go out to eat and hang out and like sleep over and stuff. So I don't know if that's considered romantic or not. Um uh, but like it's not like every single day I've got like, okay, time to message my five girlfriends and check up on like their day and everything mm -hmm. and how it's going. Like, I don't have time for that. <laughs> like, I barely have time for that with Molina. Uh, but like, I think like I'm, I'm pretty open in terms of like what the expectations are all around with everybody. Yeah. Have you, have you developed like any tools on how to handle like better? And, um, cause I'm sure you and Molina have gone through like a growth of how to, how to deal mm -hmm. with it and like the most wish efficient way possible. Develop those tools, right? Um, how, wait, oh, I'm sorry. Say that one more time. Like, have you ever, um, what are like the tools that you guys have slowly built um, to try to navigate those challenges of being in an open relationship? Like, I'm guessing the building communication is a part of it. Yeah, I think all of it is like communication stuff. Um, yeah, it's, um, yeah, I, I'd say like most of it is probably just communication stuff. It's so boring to say that, though. Um, but I think like people being honest with what they want, people being honest about their feelings, people being honest about their expectations, like all of that is really important, I think. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. Has it been hard, at, like hard for her at all um, with uh, the fact that you're both online figures because she also she streams and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So um, especially with, you know, I mean, you said that you haven't you don't meet uh, women right online, but I have a feeling that's not true. So, um, wait, wait, when did I say that? What? No, I, I think you said that, like, that you never, you never get, like, girls throwing themselves at you or something. Well, I don't get, like, I don't get people that want to fuck me for clout or anything. Like, I don't get any of, like, there are a couple of streamers that are, like, well known, like, clout chaser streamers, and they would never talk to me. That, that, I didn't say okay. I'd never get any girls online. There are a lot of people I talk to online or people that meet me, like, through my stream because they know of me or know somebody around me. Yeah, for sure. But I just, I don't get, like, the, the clout climbers, unfortunately. Has that ever been hard for her or hard for your relationship? Yeah, there's like a lot of crazy stuff we go through um, as a result of that, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure. Yeah. Um, so like, can you tell me about it? Like, I could you tell me about a situation that was particularly challenging? Like, you, it can be vague if you want it to be. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of crazy dumb shit that's happened on my stream. I'll just say that, like, I think generally the problem, what usually comes up is I feel like I'm pretty honest about my intentions and I feel like I'm pretty honest about everything that I want or what's possible. But I think at some point what usually happens is, is the girl feels like they can like break me away from Melina or get in an exclusive relationship with me. Mm -hmm. um, and then usually drama starts as a result of that, where they start either um, attacking or impeding Melina or they start getting weird about me or stuff like that. And people get like really possessive and jealous and blah, blah, blah. And I would say that like that type of stuff breeds uh, most of our problems. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's what I guessed would be a problem, right? Because even if you two are super strong, um, mm -hmm. there could be, you know, we live in a world where tons of people want to be in exclusive relationships, right? 
So uh -huh. um, it just like just naturally um, when you meet people and stuff, like I could only guess that a lot of those women would, even if they're getting into it with the thought, oh, I'm not going to try to break them up. Uh -huh. um, it probably comes up like subconsciously for them, right? Because uh -huh. that's just what they're used to. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'd say that once like people think they can hit a lot more, but then when they start like experiencing it intimately, um, then the things change very much because you don't really know how you're going to feel about something until you try it, which is something I've learned. Yeah. yeah. Have since those situations, have you tried to remedy by that by any way? Like, have you I mean, all I can do like is a contract be... or something. No, it doesn't work that way. Um, I, I try to be like as open and honest as possible. Um, and then if things go wrong, then at um... least you have the moral high ground. Well, no, I mean, I can disconnect really easily, so it's just whatever. I don't care at that point. Um, then the other person has to figure it out, yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, one of the one of the first combos I think you and I ever had was on one of Prime streams. Um, we were mm -hmm. talking about uh, whether or not you should fuck your fans. Um, and uh, you mentioned that you had, like, that you had some regrets about how you treated girls in the past. Um, mm -hmm. And... It was my, one of my first introductions to you, and I thought I really admired that you were like so honest um, about about that because it's really rare that people, especially when they're talking about girls and harassment and stuff, like people always like try to steer clear of admitting that shit. Um, mm -hmm. So could you talk a bit like about I don't know some of those moments and how you realized it was fucked up? Um, so I don't know if uh, oof, okay, this is all sounds so fucking edgy, okay, and it's really cringe because most people are way too fucking edgy online. So I think that there are like stages that I've gone through of, of like, I call it like emotional development. So I think that early on, I don't think that I emotionally connect with people that well. Um, it's like just feeling those things was just not very uh, natural to me. So I would usually have to think about them. And so I think that like in my late teens, and early 20s, what happened was is I kind of I understood like the things that needed to be said in order to get people to feel certain ways. So I think in my early 20s, I was really good at like saying the right things to get what I wanted out of people, which was in retrospect, like very manipulative. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, like if I could key in that a girl was like really into me, I know that I could like fuck her and do all sorts of shit without ever having to give anything back because I know that if as long as I say like the right, even if I never intended to be in a relationship with her. So yeah. I would say like those types of behaviors were behaviors that I exhibited a lot in my early 20s. Uh, but then as I grow up a little bit more and I mature, I'm like, okay, well, this is probably kind of exploitative. Like this is being a little bit disingenuous, blah, blah, blah. Like I think I got more responsible in terms of like how I associate with people and I'm a little bit more honest or I'm, I try to be very honest with how I present myself and what it is that I'm going after and everything. Yeah, if that makes sense. Well, like, what, what convinced you to start actually caring about, because, I mean, you could still just technically keep doing that behavior, right? Um, like, what I mean, I, I don't ever see myself. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't see myself as, like, a bad human being. I don't want to be, like, an, a bad, evil person. Like, I don't want to. And then also, I think just, like, in terms of, like, the outcomes of stuff associated with me, like, there was always, like, so much fallout with different types of people I'd associate with. And I was like, you know, it's probably better to just be, like, super open and honest with anybody that I'm with, and then they can decide for themselves if it's worth, like, associating with me because I'm um, trying to, like, hide stuff and, like, playing stupid games and all that, like, always, like, ends up imploding massively. And it's just, like, a huge, like, emotional, psychological, physical waste of time. Like, you know. So I think that just being open and honest with people is a better policy. This might sound weird, right? But like, why, why do you not want to be seen as a bad person? Um, why? Because I, I think that there's a whole bunch of like negative stuff that's entailed with being a bad person. Um, it makes people not trust you as much. It makes people not want to associate with you as much. Um, and, and then it damages your ability to form like future relationships that you could otherwise find fruitful. So I think that it's, it probably behooves you to avoid that as much as possible. That was one of the reasons too why I like, um, I would say like in my late teens, I was very much like an edgy, like uh, like Yagami light, like manipulate, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. But then in like my early 20s, like you figure out like really quickly that like, um, you know, real life isn't like movie or anime. And if you get caught lying about one thing one single time, you totally destroy like all future chances with a particular person. And like, you can't keep up like complicated lies like over and over and over again. It's just incredibly impossible to do. So I just kind of like stopped that shit, I think. Yeah. It, it was just dumb. It just wasn't, it wasn't benefiting me or anybody around me. Yeah. Um, do you think that people ever take advantage of the fact that you're willing to admit that you're wrongs, you're wrongs publicly? Um, oh yeah, for sure. People take advantage of me all the fucking time, but it's whatever. Fuck them. Yeah, well, I want to hear, like, give me an example. Um, uh, an example of people taking advantage of me, um, in, okay, well, in what way? Um, because you're, specifically because you're the type of person where you're willing to, you know, admit your wrongs publicly. 
Um, take advantage of me because I'm willing to admit my wrongs publicly. Um, well, I'd say in that regard, don't pull a train Trump names, shut fuck up. Um, I don't know how that particular thing would come up for like relationship stuff. Um, I mean, like I've had a lot of people that, um, Even this is going to be a lot of relationships. Okay. Yeah. This is going to be way more impersonal. So mm. something that I'm trying to do in 2021 going forward is um, I'm, I'm trying to be more rhetorically effective um, because in the past, I would just own any hypothetical as long as like it was logically valid. Um, I, I would just own, I would own anything that somebody would throw at me because I didn't care as long as I was correct. And I'm trying to be more, I'm trying to be more rhetorically aware going forward because I know that people use that in ways with, um, they people use that in ways that fucked me over um so i guess like one example is like um in the whole bob seven drama like i got caught up in a, just an unbelievably crazy scenario and somebody asked me like didn't you blackmail that girl and i was like yeah sure whatever i blackmail that girl i don't give a fuck um because like the, over what it was in particular was just really stupid but then i realized in retrospect i was like okay hold on when people say blackmail like they're loading it so hard with all this shit and what i did wasn't really blackmail and i probably shouldn't have owned that but i just didn't give a fuck at the time so like that's like an example of like um like okay well let's be more rhetorically effective let's not just be like ultra super brutally honest about every uh hypothetical you know like let's actually like address like well, what are you actually asking me what are you trying to imply about me you know, I try to be more mindful of that. When you talk about debating, you almost like remind me, because I study military history, right? And you almost remind me of like a general, right? Like you're always thinking like strategically, like what's effective, what's not effective. And it's like a, a unique way to navigate life. Yeah, I mean, I think now I do. I think in the past, I don't think I thought strategically at all. I really, I literally just thought like, oh, like I, these are like things that I believe in. I think I'm right and we'll follow them wherever they go. And we'll argue however you want, but I know that I'm right. And that's all I would do. I think nowadays I try to be more effective. Yeah. 2021 forward, try to be more strategically effective. Um, so how, like, when you want to look into your art, when you want to get into, um, a view, right. Um, mm -hmm. or like just get into, uh, prepare for an argument or anything like that. Like, how do you research for that? Like, how do you prep for it? Um, I think I've done this on stream a few times. I literally, I'll just Google it. Um, find a couple of news articles, start reading. If I run into something I don't understand, pop onto a Wikipedia article, start reading. Um, if there's something in the Wikipedia article I don't understand, we'll just Wikipedia that uh, topic and then we just read. Um, and then, yeah, that's basically it. Uh, and I think you can become like, rel you can become more informed than 99% of people on the internet and 98% of content creators by doing that process, 100%. How do you keep yourself from, you know, absorbing misinformation though? I. Uh, uh, hot take, I don't think misinformation is that big of a problem. I truly don't believe that is the case. I think that people that say that they're worried about media bias or misinformation are usually people that are just too lazy to do any reading. Um, the reality is, is that if you're willing to go out and read shit, like you're going to be more informed than 99% of people. The idea that like all the media is misinformed, all this bias, like you can get like at least background information and be background informed on, on almost any topic, like relatively quickly. Um, I, I think that people that complain about misinformation, like misinformation is when people get all of their news sources from fucking memes and Twitter headlines. Like that's it. Um, I, I, I don't believe that I don't believe that like misinformation is preventing people from doing real research. I think that people don't want to do the research and they use misinformation as an excuse not to do it. Do you think like a good way for someone to do research? I mean, if if they recognize because not all, not all people are good readers, right? Um, mm -hmm. So would you say that I don't know watching you know debate lords like a uh, um, you know debate on like on politics and stuff? Do you think that that's a good way to get informed? Uh, no, I don't think so. So what would you suggest? Uh, I, most as an people, most just read reading articles. Honest to God, if you read the entirety of like what Fox News publishes, you'd probably be more informed than watching shitheads debate on the internet. Debaters, like online Hot debate, take. is just it's, it's pure spectacle. Um, oftentimes, the people are incredibly fucking stupid. Um, mm. The the depths of stupidity that go into like online content creators astounds me. I cannot believe that people like fucking Kyle Kalinsky or other he or Shoe on Head that people will just regurgitate these opinions with zero factual foundation, with zero understanding of what the fuck they're talking about. It is the cringiest thing in the world to me. A lot of these people sound like they lack a high school education on most of these topics. Um, yeah, I totally like. I think that watching online debating shit is fun. I think it's really funny. Um, but in terms of getting informed from it well if you watch me you're gonna get informed but anybody else fuck that yeah but realistically no i don't i just content creators are just so unreliable like a content creator will read a twitter thread and they'll and they'll do like a 30 minute video just reading the headlines on the fucking twitter thread and they'll pretend that they know what the fuck they're talking about and it is so unbelievably cringy to me and you'll talk to people and in the course of your conversation you'll find like god fuck i don't want to call anybody out but like Fuck, oh, this sounds so bad because a lot of these people are nice and I don't mean to be mean. But like the last guy that I talked to, give me we had a three hour debate 
on like whether or not consistency in an argument was important. And he didn't know what the principle of explosion was. I was like, yeah. man, this is pretty fucking important to understand consistency in an argument. Like if you don't understand this topic, I don't understand how the fuck we're getting anything deeper than this. What the fuck? Um, or like I argue with some guy um, that, you know, that talks about how like, um, Fuck, he wanted to have this huge economic conversation with everybody. He didn't know like what like that there's an idea behind like a natural rate of unemployment. Like that was just a foreign concept to him. Or it was like I have conversations with people and there's just these like, really basic, really fundamental concepts. And they just like totally not know anything about it. And it's like, I don't know why we're talking about like macro topic, you know, XYZ, when we have no understanding of like fundamental topic A, B, and C. Like this is just so far beyond. Like, and I I I think I complained to you about this in your other score before, where we'll be on a like a prime case panel and people will be arguing about like, okay, well, I don't know if I believe in in, in a non-cognitivist, uh, uh, moral anti-realist approach. Well, hold on. Let me go ahead and look up the dictionary definition of cognitive. And it's like, wait, hold on, wait, wait, wait. We're at, you're having like a, 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 a super in-depth, like academic conversation or something. And you're going to appeal to the dictionary to try to figure out what the fuck you're talking about. Like, wait, this is so stupid. Move on to the next topic. Like this is way beyond like, yeah, I don't know. Oh my God. People just, yeah. I, to be clear, cause I'm coming up as elitist. I don't mind, um, people not knowing shit. There's a lot of stuff that I don't know. Um, but man, you like you have to be willing to do like at least a little bit of reading. Like at least like fucking wait. I never read more than a fucking Wikipedia, okay? I'm not buying all these books, okay? So like just at least read a little bit You're of the stealing Wikipedia. Stealing all the hard hard work from scholars, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, but you're you like you're addicted to these panels, right? Like you love going on them. I'm addicted to them. <sighs> I too. just like arguing with people. Yeah, fuck me. Well, why? Like explain to me the the attraction, right? I, I mean, I know the attraction, but explain. <laughs> to the audience um i i can't i really can't i was born in an age of the internet where conflict was what we thrived on um and that was just a lot of fun to me so conflict is fun and arguing with people is a form of conflict so i guess i'm drawn to it that's all i can think of realistically yeah does it kind of feel like a strategy game to you like like a video game no it's just really just fun to shout at people and find people being wrong or dumb about something that's it it's, it's that simple there's not like some like ah oh, well machiavelli you know and the Sun Tzu published this and I, you know, blah. it's not, it's really, it's more just like this guy said some dumb shit. And I'm going to go on and shout at him because that's funny to me. That's literally it. But have you never, you've never learned from any of them or like oh, any debate? Have you ever like learned a new fact or um, mm. I don't know, being more informed because of it? I think I've gotten lucky in that most of the learning that I do, um, I think my own community holds me honest. Um, pretty often, which is something I'm pretty grateful of. I think most of the things that I've learned have usually come from, I'll have, I'll go on some rant about something on stream and then I'll get some people that will start emailing me. It's like, hey, you said this thing and you're like very wrong on this. You said this, you're very wrong on this. Like I'm like, a, I'm a PhD history student and like, you don't know what the difference between history and historiography is. And I didn't even know what that term was until like a year or two ago. And it's like, oh shit. Very important. Um, or like, yes, incredibly important. Yeah. yeah. Or people will email me like all sorts of like random things and shit. It's like, oh cool. And then when I, and then that's, I think that's where most of my information comes from. Is usually a fan will email me correcting me on something. It's like, oh, okay, cool. Is that one of the coolest parts about being an online figure is like all the because you're exposed to so many people, you're just on average going to be exposed to really interesting people or educated who are mm -hmm. trying to correct you on things. Yeah, I think so. Um, I am very lucky that I have fans that like, yeah, know a lot of shit sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So if you ever, you know, want me to educate you about the correct opinions on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, just let me know. Right? Oh, will you be able to find somebody that can do it for me? God damn it. How you can't do that on my own stream? My fans will get you, okay? I have, oh, I think, a hundred okay. of them. All okay, right, they will get you. Okay, well, if they're virtual like you are, I won't have any problems with that, right? What? Okay. Well, you know what? It's fine. You want to get canceled by the cartoon rights community? That's okay. Yeah. yeah. But we're, the cartoon we're rights community? You guys are yeah. going to have, what, lollycons on your side? You think that's going to cancel me? Okay. We don't associate with lollycons. We separated from them a long time ago. Yeah. So, yeah, we don't talk about that part. Um, is the, um, are there, is there like a merit in ideological labels or sh do you think that people should just, I don't know, elaborate, just talk specifically about positions? Um, I think categories exist because they provide some utility to people. So it would be nice if they were providing utility, but I feel like some categories have gotten very confusing now, such that when you identify something, you immediately have to say all the things that you're not or all the things that you are, which makes them kind of worthless. So I don't know. I mean, there's some value to them, but it's generally you end up having to ask people their policy positions because you don't know what the fuck they mean when they're talking about something. Like if somebody says like, oh, like I'm a sock dev, like that could be everything to from like you're a neoliberal mm -hmm. all the way over to like you're actually like a fucking tanky that's too scared to admit you know that you're a tanky right so i don't know yeah and what was left and right wing was very different like a hundred years ago like it's very it's constantly evolving and changing 
And I feel like, especially right now, we're right in the middle of that change. So it mm -hmm. particularly feels like a useless category. Sure. Even 20 years ago, right? The difference between mm -hmm. neocons, you know, a uh, past of 20 years ago versus like Trump Republicans or Tea Partiers today is like very different. Yeah, no, like completely different. Like you would almost think that they were totally different parties. Um, uh -huh. Okay. Do you think online political communities have made politics more or less like vitriolic? Uh, more vitriolic for sure. Online stuff is just super cancer. Do you think it's because of the anonymity? Um, I don't know. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, people do the cancel culture shit and those people aren't anonymous. So <laughs> I don't know if it's the anonymity that it actually makes it. It might just be people have dog shit opinions on the internet allows it to express them like safely, I guess. Well, yeah, because they're anonymous. Would you get rid of... Okay, if you could, if you could just wipe out anonymity on the internet, would you? Well, that's, yeah, I, I mean, I would because I am I have to deal with ultimate accountability because I'm accountable to every single thing that I yeah. do. Yeah, so for me, it would be beneficial. Um, but in terms of like, I, I, like I said before, I don't know if it's the fact that they're anonymous. I don't know if that's the thing that does it because it seems like you have a lot of dumb fucks that are like, their names are public and everything and they still say and mm -hmm. do dumb shit. Yeah. Well, one of the biggest criticisms against me as a VTuber, right, was that they felt other people felt like I wasn't going to be held accountable for my actions, right? Okay. Which, which I found strange, right? Because it's not like other people are putting up their addresses um, mm -hmm. as well. Like, what does that, what does accountable mean in that instance? Um, mm -hmm. But the reason why I have to be a v VTuber is because the people, everyone else is anonymous. So mm -hmm. there's very little pushback I get against like, I don't know, like harassment and stuff, especially the shit that women have to deal with. Um, so I do feel like if everyone wasn't, if I, like basically if the people were trying to get me were not anonymous, then I wouldn't have to be anonymous. So it just yeah, kind sure. of solved the whole problem. Like a nuclear arms race kind of thing or whatever, or like a man, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. If charity could provide all the social programs um, would you see the government supply, like, I don't know, healthcare? Um, would you like to see, like, the government supply it, like, healthcare, et cetera? Wait, are you asking me, like, if charity could provide for everything, should the government be doing it regardless? Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I, ideally, I guess that'd be good, but the problem is charity is probably never going to totally equitably distribute all these things in society in the way that it's needed, so it's probably better for Have you ever, like, contributed to a charitable organization? Mm, I've done like fundraisers in the past, but I don't. Um, I guess I've donated to some individual causes, but not, not too much. It's not like a big part of what I care about. Oh, why don't you care about it? Like, what are some? I'm guessing there's some criticisms, like there. Uh, I, no, I don't think it's criticism. I just personally don't feel very fulfilled, like sending a thousand bucks like a charity. It just doesn't feel like I'm doing much. What, like, I but what feels like you're doing a lot is probably the political canvassing because i've heard you say that yeah because it's more like direct like on the ground yeah like if i can help somebody like i've probably like there is like an individual i knew that for instance like needed money um push them over the edge for like a surgery for like transition or whatever and they were like short by a little bit um and donating to like make up that gap like that felt really good it's like oh cool like here's one person i'm making like a measurable impact on like this is something i think is cool well i've heard like some charities have tried to answer that problem right by um, sending you like pictures and stuff yeah yeah, yeah there's mm -hmm. that's the stereotype but or I, I think there's things like kiva right where you invest in a specific person um mm -hmm. and you know specifically about their story and everything like mm -hmm. associated with that but i don't know i've also like i i felt really bad about the fact that i haven't contributed like yeah. at that level um okay so uh for people who are watching me they know that I, I study the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I'm really passionate about it. Um, uh, what, what's your take on it? Do you have any takes? You're just going to, what's your take on Israel-Palestine? Um, I don't know. I, I, every time I try to do any research, it seems like both sides have fucked up quite a bit in the past. Um, I don't know what the, I don't know what the correct answer is there. Um, I, I truly don't know. I really don't know. What do you think is the right answer? Like a two-state solution or? Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I mean, ideally, I would like to see eventually, you know, moving towards a one state, but I don't think that's viable right now. So I would say, How, do you think that if a two solution. state solution, if that was implemented, do you think that Hamas and all the foreign funding that they get from other groups, especially in Iran, do you, do you think they would chill and be cool with Israel? Or do you think that the attacks and everything would still continue? That's because that's my issue is I feel like I have a hard time. Believing no, I that, think like, they would just get less support. 
I think like the more Palestinians, uh, you know, get oppressed from Israel or from other groups uh, like Jordan, mm -hmm. they the more radicalized and, you know, the more support someone like Hamas, like a group like Hamas gets. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. It'd be cool if that was the case. If um, if Israel or in the U.S., I guess, reaching out would, would try to develop some two-state solution, um, if that would chill, but you know, I don't know. So something that actually annoys me about that conflict is that people always want to talk about it, right? It's always like the thing that um, people bring up when it comes to like, I don't know, outside political conflicts. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything that you wish people were talk would be talking about more, like in terms of foreign conflicts? Um, I think Israel Palestine, I think is is pretty relevant because Israel is like pretty directly supported by the United States. Mm -hmm. um, based on the little bit that I've read, it seems like you can make pretty decent arguments that there's like some form of apartheid going on um, between Israelis and, and Palestinians, um, especially recently that whole thing where like Israel has been like vaccinated at record fucking rates and they won't even vaccinate Palestinians that come into work in Israel um, is pretty crazy. Um, so, I mean, I understand why it's a hot issue for people and why it's why people think it's worth talking about, because the it's probably one of the few issues where the U.S. can have its thumb on it the most. Like, I imagine oh, if we huge, the U.S. Mm -hmm. has a huge impact on what goes on in Israel. Yeah. So, like, it's one of those things where, like, you know, like we can complain about the Uyghurs in China, but, you know, what do we do about that is it's a very complicated question. But in terms of like the Palestinians, like that's an issue where the United States could be a leader on that and say, like, hey, this is what's going to happen, you know, figure it out. Or, or you're fucked, right? That's something that the United States could take like a Bosnian role, like we like we did with Bosnia, where we could step in and be like, hey, like uh, we're going to, uh, yeah, we're, we're gonna we're gonna solve this right now, figure it out. But we don't. So. Well, yeah, one of the things that people haven't talked about a lot is Hillary Clinton. Um, people don't like to talk about the positives of her, but uh -huh. she actually directly um, caused, I think, the 2012 Gaza War to have a ceasefire and led to like I don't know thousands of Palestinians having their lives saved. So mm -hmm. there have been like a few instances, um, there have been a few instances like that where the government's had, the United States has had like a positive impact. So, or a negative yeah. impact like Trump with Jerusalem last year. Yeah, I I didn't even know that about Hillary, to be honest. I, I know that people associate her way more negatively with like, um, like Gaddafi's assassination of Libya and everything and stuff going on with that, but. Um, oh yeah, she stayed up all night in Mahmoud Abbas's hotel room. Uh, who mm -hmm. Mahmoud Abbas is the leader of the um, uh, of Fatah, which is the other party, right? Um, mm -hmm. And just negotiating uh, a ceasefire, and there were all these conflicts because he couldn't. He was worried about the safety of his kids from like, more radical Muslim extremists and stuff mm -hmm. in school, and so she had to like negotiate to try to get them out of the school and like this whole thing to get him to agree to the ceasefire. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I don't know. Okay. It's a cool, cool story. Um, associate with that but you actually like hillary clinton now right or i shouldn't say you like her but do you think you would have supported her instead of bernie yeah i was just stupid i but i mean i was younger okay i was a wee lad of 26 27 <laughs> oh yeah that's you know so what young. did i know back then yeah what did i know back then um i think hillary clinton was way more based than i gave her credit for she was just she was way more mature than i was um so i was very much like an idealistic bernie supporter but i, I think i was just stupid at the time i just didn't know as much as i did but where's your HRC photo, like, picture in the background? True, I don't have any. That's like, you right. need, like, a poster. Yeah, I'll work on that, okay? Okay, yeah, because she doesn't get enough representation on Twitch. That's a huge yeah. problem. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. So, I think, like, I covered most of the questions I had. There's just one last question I had that's really, really important to me personally. Okay. Um, why, why do you hate us VTubers? Like, um, tell me, tell me how you really feel. So I feel like we've had this very strange trend online where people don't remember what like normal, especially women look like. Um, so it started with women wearing a fuck ton of makeup, which is whatever. Then it started with like this weird like makeup plus filters. And then now on like Instagram, I don't know if you've ever heard of an app called Facetune, but like, oh my God, we are yeah. so far removed from like where no, the you fuck get to completely and, change how you look. Yeah, and then now it's like moving to the point that where people are like unironically getting obsessed with anime girls online that have found a way to be like real people. I don't know, man. That shit is. <laughs> I think that's really unhealthy mentally, but that's from it. Yeah. So you're worried about like I guess the consequences, like the yeah, larger consequences like, of it. People like getting obsessed with things that are moving further and further away from reality. Yeah. I can see that, especially with some VTubers that are also like their voices are different too. Like they're a full character. 
mm-hmm. as well. So that kind of makes sense. Um, do you, is there a part of you that finds it exciting at least that a bunch of people who were kind of too scared to get involved online because of showing their face, now they can, you know, come out with, uh, you know, in 2D? Now you um, get a chance to talk to them. I, maybe, I guess. Maybe when I, if I meet a cool VTuber, maybe I'll change my mind on that. Wait, th- Okay, that is the third insult, and I'm not, I'm not okay with this. Yeah. What the fuck? Um, Are you gonna virtually slap me? Actually, I don't have that animation yet, but I'll work mm-hmm. on it. Um, right now, all I can do is just visually cry. Oh, wait, can you cry yeah. on stream? Are you doing that right now? Yeah, I'm crying right now. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah, it's like very sad. I can also blush. I can do a bunch of things. I just finished this avatar. So. Oh my god. Well, look at that. I know. Pretty right? soon you're going to have a substitution for all real emotions. Nice job. That's actually, that's been the goal with this. So. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I wish you would have come out here on your VTube avatar so we were at least like, you know, a little a little more similar on that end. Okay, that would be well, really next cool. time. Okay, on the next panel we're on, I'll make sure to break out my VTuber again, okay? Okay, well. Um, well, uh, yeah. So, um, thanks so much for, you know, for doing this interview. It's super cool. I'm like just getting started the streaming, so it was really cool that you were willing to support me and all of that stuff. Um, mm-hmm. And... Uh, I don't know if um, if any of your viewers haven't haven't tried the the VTubing right um, or paid attention, you should definitely you should definitely uh, sub to me or follow me on Twitch. I'm Aristocracy TV, and uh, yeah, that was super cool. Thanks, Dustin. Gotcha. All right. Well, hey, thanks for the interview. Have fun. Okay. See ya. Yeah. Be careful. Dusty always says that. Be careful. It's interesting that he always says that. <laughs>